Paul Church, glad you're here this morning. Just an absolute gorgeous day out today, so I'm so thankful for that. A few announcements I do want to share with you. Uh, first of all, the, the flowers around are um, memory of Ron Welling. His service was yesterday as we celebrated his going home to heaven. And um, <clears throat> so other announcements now, choir practice following the worship service, and they're going to be meeting in here. All right, so that's for the patriotic concert tonight, which is at 7 p.m., so I encourage you to come back tonight. Uh, we're going to celebrate America. We're going to celebrate those who have served and those who are serving in our community and just have a lot of great fun uh, as we have fellowship together. So that's tonight. Tomorrow at 9, tomorrow at 9 a.m., Operation Christmas Child Packing Party. So if you want to help out packing some of the boxes for kids that will be sent out all over the world so the gospel of Jesus Christ can get, come out, I encourage you to do that um, and be part of that. Prime Timers sign-up sheet um, for the pasta party that's going to be on November 20th. So we want to encourage you to sign up for that on the bulletin board. Uh, we just want to know how small we have to break the spaghetti up. So... That'll be important. And then um, one of the privileges we have, one of the great things we like to do as a congregation is provide goodie boxes for our college students. And so there is a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for college goodie boxes. And then how many of you were totally disappointed in not having enough trick-or-treaters? How many of you have leftover candy that none of us should be eating probably, beginning with me as the pastor? All right, so great sales now on Halloween candy, but we need candy for the Advent bags uh, and for the Advent devotionals. So if you want to start bringing your candy in for that, uh, that will be great, and that will be then given with the Advent devotionals this year. So those are our announcements. We'll begin our worship service with the ringing of the bell and our prelude. Thank you. 
invite you to stand with me. Hymn number 170, One Day.
invite you now to join me in the call to worship. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come expectedly like a thief in the night. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Heavenly Father, one day, We sang about that. One day and we understand the birth narrative. One day and we understand the cross. One day we understood the resurrection. One day we even understood your ascension. But there is that one day, Lord, that we are looking forward to. One day when you will return and take us home to be with you. But for this day, Lord, We invite your presence right here with us as we worship, that your Holy Spirit would fall fresh on us, Lord, and that, Father, we would sense your presence through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Hymn number 549.
face to face in all his glory, I shall see him in the by and by. So for the last two months, as you've been praying for Ron, I got to tell you in visiting him, Ron's desire was to go to heaven. He knew his faith in Christ would carry him there, but he was looking forward to it. To have that reunion, of course, with Levon, but to go ahead and be with his Savior. And so we come to this time this morning, I want to encourage you during our time of silent prayer to, of course, pray for Ron's family. But then I want you to reflect on your own life, face to face. Is that what we're looking forward to, that we will be looking forward to seeing Jesus? Do we have the assurance? Do you have the assurance that when that time comes, you will wake up in heaven and see him face to face? Let's pray together. Lord, Ron didn't know the day or the hour, but he knew it was coming. And he was looking forward to it, Lord. He wasn't looking forward just to leave family and leave friends. But he knew, Lord, that his time was coming, that his body was growing weak. And Father, he was looking forward to going home to heaven. And so, Lord, I pray for each one of us here today. Is are we looking forward to that? And most of us, Lord, probably want to go ahead and put it off. Wait till we're really old or really sick, all of those things. But Lord, remind us that you can come back at any moment of any day. That truly we anticipate and look forward to the day of the Lord. And while we wait here, Lord, help us to be your disciples, to share the good news with Jesus Christ with those around us. It was a task that you gave 2,000 years ago to those first disciples. So help us, Lord, to continue the task. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of praying the prayer you taught your first disciples, and we share this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in our worship now as we wait on you for his tithes and then our offerings.
We praise you, Father, for the privilege of returning to you that portion of our lives that we call the tithe. And also, Lord, for the generosity we can give in giving our offerings. So we ask your blessing on these gifts and tithes, Lord. Use them to further your kingdom. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, as we continue on our study in 2 Peter, and as we're drawing to a close, Lord, we're once again looking at Jesus' second coming, looking towards the day of the Lord. And so again, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, it's not about my words, but it's about your words. We pray, Father, that you will give us insight and you will give us understanding. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Last Sunday, I'm not giving you a review. You can look at that online. But in that sermon, I talked about God's calendar and how Jesus has been in heaven for two years. Based off of verse 8 of, of 2 Peter chapter 3, which says, With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So, it's almost been 2,000 years since he ascended to heaven, so two days up in heaven. Well, on Monday, I got thinking, and I got into the office, and I like to start right away on the sermon, and I got thinking about Noah and his ark. Not really a strange thing, as you remember now, twice in 2 Peter, the ark is mentioned, Noah's mentioned once, and then <clears throat> some other things about it, and I got thinking about Noah's ark and the second coming of Jesus. This is the way my brain works, so I thought, how long did it take to build Noah's Ark? Now, I went ahead and did some deep research. That's dangerous for me. But I found out that it took a year and a half to build the replica Ark in Kentucky. Of course, they had 700 workers for that, and I will put a shameless plug in it. Sue and I have been there, it was a wonderful experience. But then I got thinking, okay, what about Noah's Ark? Now, I have read anywhere from 40 days to 120 years to build Noah's Ark. And I'm going to tell you this, that the Bible doesn't give us an exact number. But the way my brain works, I decided I wanted to give you some numbers that the Bible does give us, and through those numbers, I have kind of shaped my own opinion. So let me underscore that. It is my opinion, it is not a biblical fact of how long it took Noah to build the ark, okay? So I want you to, but I want you to see how my brain goes. So in Genesis chapter 5, verse 32, and I'm going to keep my eyes down here because I can't always read that up there. Noah was 500 years old when he started having kids. Now all of us dads are like, oh, that just seems a little old for me. But then I realized, and Sue's like, this is not in the script at all. And I realized all those movie stars who have st kids at 75 years old and that type of thing, I'm like, what are those people thinking? But just let's go with this. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 6, Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. That's 100 years difference. He started having kids. 600 years later, we have the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, God mentions that humans will now live to be 120 years old. 
If you read through the Old Testament, you're going to see post-Noah that the age of humanity stops, starts to drop off. All right, so that you can research that on your own. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 18, God said, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. All right. At 600 years old, we know that this is going to happen. That the family, you're going to have Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives are going to enter in the ark. All right, the last one, number comes from Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. The son of Noah, Shem, is now two years after the flood when Shem was 100 years old, he came, became the father of Arphaxad. All right, so we have some numbers here that give us some idea. Now let me tie this together. Noah was 500 years old when he first became a dad. Somewhere in that range, that's when it started. 600 years old, all right, we enter the ark with the families. So husband, wife, husband, 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 wife, wife, wife. They're all entering the ark. Shem was probably born at five, and five, when Moses, I mean, when Noah, let me get the right names here, was 502 years old. That, you just go back to his age when he first had kids and subtract the numbers. Now, it would take probably 16 to 20 years for Shem to go ahead and get married. He wasn't a infant when he got married. So 16 to 20 years later, he's getting married. Then his brothers are getting married. And so, again, this is my figuring on this. This is not modern math, but very simple based off of traditions. So the time between 518 years old for Noah and 520 years old for Noah. Figuring that maybe Mrs. Noah had a kid year after year after year, so let's just say at 520 years old, the boys would have been married. And in Genesis 6, when we read the account of Noah and the flood, it would be roughly 80 years later would have happened when Noah was 600 years old. So here's my modern math. Roughly it took 75 to 80 years because that was the time from when Noah's boys were married old enough to produce a family, or to be married and get set, so 75 to 80 years old. There's a reason for I came up with these numbers. But for, let's just take it at 75 to 80 years. Noah's neighbors watched him build the ark, and yet none of them survived the flood. And I am sure that they mocked Noah for those 75 to 80 years. For what he believed in and what was going to happen, they mocked him about that. From 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, we read these words. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Peter is saying this happened. The only people ready for the flood, though, was Noah and his family. So my question for us today is, who is ready for the day of the Lord? Who is ready for this to happen? And so as I was studying this week, Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 21 through 22. And say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land. On the mountain of Israel, there will be one king over all of them, and they never again will be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. That was 75 years ago, 1948, May 14th, that Israel became a nation. It had not been a nation on that land with God's chosen people for over 2,500 years. And so I go ahead and say this to you again. 
Are you ready for the day of the Lord? You see, it can come at any time. So think about this. You read God's word, you know the history. Did Ezekiel's prophecy become fulfilled in 1948? And is this a sign of the eventual day of the Lord? It is definitely something I've been thinking about, and I've been thinking about it for years. You see, Peter continues in our text, helping us prepare for the day of the Lord. And he lets us know how it will start. He lets us know what will happen, and then how we ought to be. So how will the day of the Lord start? Suddenly it's going to happen when nobody was expecting. Sounds kind of like 75 to 80 years that people would talk about what Noah was doing, but nobody was really expecting that this flood would come. So from our text, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. From 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now what I find very interesting about this is that the term thief is usually associated with negative behavior. A thief usually comes and takes something that doesn't belong to them. That's the way our mentality is. A thief comes when it's not expected. I know anybody who's ever been robbed by a thief, you didn't go ahead and say, oh, I'm expecting them to rob me any day now. A thief comes and takes something that doesn't belong to them. A thief comes and he takes something valuable, something of worth, something that is often precious. On the day of the Lord, that thief is God. And the valuable, worthy, and precious plunder is going to be every believer in Jesus Christ. Every person who has a relationship with Jesus. Every person, I'll use the term, who was born again, whose name is written in the book of life, that God went ahead and said, yeah, there's Scott Navistat. I got his name in the book. And we will be stolen from the world. Well, when is this going to happen? I don't have a clue, folks. I have some ideas that I'm, if you ask my opinion, but I don't know when it's going to happen. It'll catch the world off guard. Like a thief, nobody is really expecting it to happen. There's not going to be warnings. We're not going to go ahead, tune in the news. CNN, Fox News is not going to have a headline that says, the day of the Lord's coming soon, folks. Make sure you're ready. But it is going to happen. Last week, we focused on God's calendar and how patient God is. How he has been waiting so that the good news of Jesus Christ could be shared throughout the world. And I said earlier, that is our job to do. That is what the Christian believer is supposed to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those around them. But I have to admit, as I've been writing this, and it was like, we have the internet now, we have radio, we have television, we have all kinds of kind of communications. And I have to tell you, it almost seems impossible for the good news of Jesus not to have been shared throughout the world. But there will be a time when God's patience comes to an end. And we need to realize that we've read in Scripture about God's patience, and it's laid out for us. It's part of his plan right now. But his plan, his overall plan, will come into fulfillment. His holiness, Jesus' sacrifice, the faithfulness of you and I as believers will be fulfilled on the day of the Lord. And the patience of God will end. And it's really going to end with a bang. Think for a moment. Again, this is how my week goes sometimes. I was wondering how many people are in the world. So, like many of you, I googled it. How many people are in the world? Approximately 8 billion. I didn't count them. I just assumed that it's somewhat, somewhat factual. But then I googled how many Christians are in the world. 
And it gave me a number, and I'm going to share that with you. And I got to believe that the Christians that are in the world, I, I'm assuming that those are na- they are people who do not identify with another religion. I'm not questioning the spirituality of them, but the number was 2.38 billion. Now, that means on the day of the Lord, the world will instantly be affected because 25% of the world's population will be affected by the day of the Lord. And the other 75% are going to have to come up with an excuse. Like, where'd they go? Think about that. Now, i got to tell you, though, let me go back to that 2.38 billion Christians and let me go ahead. If they are just identifying because they're not another religion and they don't have a relationship with Jesus, those people will still be here. And they'll really have a lot to wonder about also. The day of the Lord will start when God takes his followers home to heaven. He will steal us like a thief into heaven. I look forward to it. The next question that Peter answers is, well, what's going to actually happen? What will happen? And i got to tell you, it is not going to be good if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Let me say this quickly for those of you who like to look at the end times and all of those things that go with it that we read in Daniel, that we read in Ezekiel, that we read in Revelation, that we read in Matthew. Peter is not giving us a prolonged view of the end times. He is not laying out the plan for the end times. He is giving us the abbreviated look. The Christians will go to heaven. And for the rest, well, the rest of verse 10 says, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Then in the second half of verse 12, we read, That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. It will not be good. In verse 6, Peter reminded us, we talked earlier about Noah and the flood, and the deluge, and that everything was destroyed. In chapter 2, as we in our studies of 2 Peter, in verse 5, he mentions the flood and how God protected those who were righteous. Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Mrs., Mrs., and Mrs. were all protected. Early I said I thought the ark maybe was 75 to 80 years to build. That's an opinion. But I got to tell you what we know is a fact is there's not going to be another flood. There's not going to be another ark. We're not going to have that opportunity to watch it build, 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 build. But there will be a fire. And the elements will melt. But you and I, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have a fireproof Savior. And if you remember the story, if you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Basic theme was, I see four in the midst of the fire, and one looks like a God. Folks, that was Jesus in the fire, and my Savior and your Savior is fireproof. I've read a few writers who think that maybe it's going to be a nuclear explosion. Like maybe it's going to be an atomic bomb blasting off in the earth, in the sky, above us, or something like that. Then earlier this week, I read this article. The United States is developing an atomic bomb 24 times more powerful than the one dropped on Hiroshima. Just came out in the news. Personally, I don't need to know what the government's developing as far as their weapons. That's just my opinion. But personally, I do not think God will need human devices to accomplish his tasks. I don't think God is going and saying, well, the Russians got this many nuclear weapons, and Chinese have this, and Israel has this, and the United States has this. Look, God did not need any of humanity's help to accomplish his purpose for the flood at Noah's time. He didn't ask and say, okay, 
make a bunch of reservoirs so I can put all the water in one place. God didn't need any help, as we saw earlier in 2 Peter, with the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then I read about this. Mount St. Helens, you remember that? March 20th, 1980. Mount St. Helens in Washington was supposedly a dormant volcano. It began to quake and rumble. The local population was, in, was gone ahead and evacuated to a quote-unquote safe place eight miles away. Later, the side of the mountain began to bulge. Scientists were not alarmed. Because those are all the smart people. They were not alarmed because past research of volcanoes indicated they never blow sideways. Oh, okay. On May 18th, almost two months after the initial rumblings, the side of Mount St. Helens exploded, shooting tons of debris downhill at a speed of 150 miles per hour. A minute later, the volcano exploded upward an equivalent power of 500 atomic bombs. 230 square miles of forest were devastated and 57 people lost their lives. The scientists had assumed that the natural events would continue as before. And the article says, but they were wrong. I read this article, I knew about this, this is in my generation, 1980. And then I got thinking, okay, so what about all the other volcanoes in the world? We've seen them and that type of thing. You might be familiar with the Ring of Fire, which surrounds all the Pacific and all the volcanoes that they have there. Mount St. Helens was a dormant volcano. So then I googled extinct volcanoes in the United States. Because we have them, so we don't have to worry about them, right? And I thought, well, they're all in California. They're all, they're all on that side of the country. And then I went ahead and I Googled and I found out there's an extinct one in Illinois. Now, I know some of you are thinking, you're hoping it's in downtown Chicago, but that's a whole political thing that you would be going on. I grew up in New Jersey. There's one in New Jersey, New Hampshire, Missouri, Michigan. My, my son is in Virginia. Yes, my son in Antarctica, so I looked there. They actually have uh, active ones in Antarctica, and I'm like, who ever thought that? Because it seems a little cold there. Look, I don't know how God is going to accomplish the coming destruction, but I gotta tell you, there is a host of built-in mechanisms in his creation that is available for him at any time. Look, I know it's easy for us to worry about all of the ills of the world that are all around us, many of them created by humanity. But I believe and I know God is in control. And folks, I know and you know the end of the story. We, if we have a faith in Christ, will be with him in eternity, which is why God wants us to share the message of hope with those around us and not worry about what's going on around us here on earth. C.S. Lewis said, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. I would rather be heaven-focused than to be anxious about what's going on around me. The day of the Lord will start suddenly. The world's not going to be expecting it. And the believer in Jesus Christ will be taken like a thief in the night to be with God. The final question that Peter answers is, well then, how ought we to be? I gotta tell you, we don't have to be like Chicken Little. The sky is not falling on us. You and I, we won't feel the burn. We won't feel the heat. Verse 11, the first half of verse 12. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Looking forward. Folks, our future 
is in heaven. And eventually, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and we will be part of it. We ought to live holy and godly lives, and the simple reason is because we know what's in the future for us. We live that way here on earth because we're going to be blessed in heaven. Think about this for a moment. The things of this world that you and I are urged to pursue, and I do this also. Sue and I were talking about last night what we should do for some investments coming up. We're thinking this way because, boy, oh boy, we need to prepare. We think about the materialistic side of our living. Think about mortgage rates. Buying a house now would not be fun. Although when we bought our first house, we were in those kind of interest rates. We worry about our homes, our yards, the harvest, the fields, our machinery, our jobs, all of those things. When it comes to the day of the Lord, none of those things will remain. Folks, we treasure our families, we treasure our friends, we treasure our co-workers. But I gotta tell you, let's be blunt. If they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord will have an entirely different meaning for them. The word holy means set apart. It means different. Holy is everything that God approves. We separate ourselves from evil and live a life dedicated to God. Godliness in this verse means living our lives towards God. Without Jesus, we have a bent towards sinning. With our relationship with Jesus, then we have a bent towards the things of God, that which is pleasing to him. Godliness is about pursuing and living out our faith in the image of God, and that the image of God becomes visible in our lives. Our goal should be to live a life devoted to pleasing to God. Pastor and Bible commentary writer John MacArthur describes holiness and godliness this way. Holy conduct refers to action. Godliness refers to attitude. Holy conduct refers to the way I live my life Godliness refers to the spirit of reverence within me, which I live my life. And so Peter is saying, what kind of person ought you to be in heart and in behavior, in motive and in action, in attitude and in duty? When our spiritual attitude and our actions are lived out, we look forward to the day of the Lord because we look forward to seeing Jesus face to face. Let's be a little candid here about this for a moment. You and I, I'm assuming you're, you're like me, some better, some worse. We struggle with personal holiness. We struggle with personal godliness. We are not perfect. But when the day of the Lord comes, the battle will be over. And yes, we will see Jesus face to face. We sang, only faintly now I see him with the darkling veil between, but a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. I'm a firm believer that every Christian knows the difference between right living and sinful living. They know it. I'm a firm believer that we also, 99.9% of the time, I leave one for like maybe I bumped my head and didn't realize this, but I believe we know when we sin. We know when we willfully disobey God's word. Now, I will tell you this though, I do believe that there are those times where we unintentionally might hurt someone by our words that we might have spoken or by what they thought they heard us say. But I gotta tell you, that's a different sermon because that's about forgiveness and extending it and receiving it. But living out in holiness and godliness is you and I making the right choices 
when the sin opportunity comes. When it comes to living in holiness and godliness, we should be blessed. Because you and I, we know the future. And knowing that a Christian's future is in heaven, we should be spurred on to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do with others. Peter says if we do that, it'll speed up this process. Of course, God knows the calendar, the dates. But the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, that's what he calls us to do. So yes, we can say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We're looking forward to it. Would you pray with me, please? Oftentimes, Lord, we go ahead and we want you to come back, but we want you to come back on our terms. We want a lot of things on our terms, Lord. But Father, your terms were your Heavenly Father's terms where your body was broken, your blood was shed, so that we could have this opportunity to look forward to your second coming. Help us, Lord, to live in your presence here on earth, in Jesus' name, amen. We come to this table of remembrance. We call it communion. At St. Paul Church here, we practice open communion. If you know Christ, if you're seeking Christ, you are more than happy we're with you to participate. You'll receive both cups at the same time inside the, the, uh, one cup will have the bread, the other cup will have the juice. We'll ask that we hold that together and we'll give you instructions. So I invite our council members up at this time. They will be serving you and we want you to just be in a spirit of prayer as you receive this, and then we'll share it together.
amazing thing about the Lord's Supper. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's share in it together. In the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. They all knew the old covenant. They're all good Jewish, good Jewish boys gathered there. But he called it the cup of the new covenant and was found in his blood, he said. This is my blood. And it was found for the forgiveness of sins. And he said to them, let's share in it. Of course, the forgiveness was for you, for me, if we choose to accept it. And accepting it, we have a relationship with Jesus. And with that relationship with Jesus, one day he's coming for you and for me. It says that they sang a hymn, our closing hymn, How Do We Do Holiness and Godliness? And our closing hymn gives us some ideas. Take time to be holy. Make the choice. Speak off to the Lord. Yeah, we want you to pray about it. Abide in him always, which means he's always with you. Feed on his word, which means we have to read it, we have to study it, and I encourage memorizing it. Make friends with God's children. Come to coffee hour today. Enjoy the fellowship. Come back tonight for the patriotic concert. Help those who are weak. Yep, that's called serving. Forgetting in nothing his blessing, because we do what we do because we want his blessing, his glory. Folks, that's just the first verse. So stand with me and sing hymn number 441, Take Time to Be Holy. <laughs>
fitted for service above. Looking forward to that day, Lord. Looking forward. But count it a privilege to serve you here and now. Reaching others with the message and the hope of Jesus Christ. Dismiss us in your blessing, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.